Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing the calocrine kinin system. Okay, so we've discussed that um, when you have a pathogen invading your tissue, that that pathogen will have all sorts of molecules associated with it that normal human cells would just never, ever have. Okay, and we've grouped all of these together underneath this umbrella term, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. Okay, now, uh, these PAMPs have m receptors on the surface of these sentinel cells which bind to them. And I want to stress that, you know, there are many different PAMPs, and they'll all have their own different receptors, so that it's not as though every single PAMP in existence is binding to the same receptor. No, they'll all have different receptors. Okay, so dendritic cells, ma resident macrophages, and mast cells are the three sentinel cells we've looked at. And uh, when their pattern recognition receptors are activated by the binding of their ligand, uh, then that will trigger the activation of these um, sentinel cells. And when activated, the dendritic cells and resident macrophages start releasing the two uh, peptides, interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, and mast cells degranulate and release histamine. Okay, now both of these, uh, well all three of these in fact, are going to go to uh, endothelial cells of blood vessels in the local area and they're going to cause uh, the acute inflammatory response which really is all about the endothelial cells because uh, the acute inflammatory response is about bringing in troops from the blood into the interstitial fluid. Now how do you start bringing in troops from the blood. Well, what's stopping things from coming out of the blood is the endothelial cells. They control what moves from the blood into the interstitial fluid. So it's completely and utterly about the endothelial cells. Okay, so let's just briefly talk about the um, types of microvasculature that you will have in a tissue. Okay, so that's a nice key word. So, microvasculature, what do I mean by that? I mean very small blood vessels, okay? So, when people talk about the macrovasculature, they mean the big vasculature. They mean uh, arteries, veins, the things you have to learn the names of in anatomy. Those are the macrovasculature. The microvasculature, you don't have to learn the names of in anatomy because you can't see them, okay? Um, so, in normal tissues, what you'll have all over the place is little blood vessels called arterioles. And I want to stress these are tiny. Do not confuse them for the arteries. Arteries are massive. Arterioles are tiny little things. Okay, so here's an arteriole. Okay, and it's going to split into some even smaller blood vessels known as capillaries. Okay, so here are free capillaries, and these are absolutely tiny, and these are what are often known as the uh, business end of the microvasculature, and the reason they're called that is because these are where the actual exchange occurs. So, remember, what the what is the um, purpose of the uh, vascular system? Well, it's to try and um, maintain a constant internal milieu, okay? So we want to try and keep um, uh, the oxygen concentration and the glucose concentration that the cells are bathed in nice and constant, okay? So the capillaries are responsible for that. They're responsible for bringing in glucose and oxygen to supply to the tissues which are using that up, and um, they will take away waste products such as carbon dioxide. Okay, so here are the capillaries, okay? And then they will reconverge to form a venule over here. So this is a venule, and here are the capillaries. Okay, so I just want to show you briefly the structure of these blood vessels, uh, because it's important when we're going to look at the acute inflammatory response. So, if we imagine cutting through an arteriole and then looking at uh, the arteriole in cross-section, then what we'll see is something along the lines of this, okay? so. Um, let me draw the endothelial cells. Okay, so this is an endothelial cell here. Okay, that's its nucleus there, that's that little bulge out there. Okay, and then we're going to continue on, so they will make a complete tube. Okay, 
And the important thing to note is that multiple endothelial cells are needed to make up the entire circumference. And that's going to be what's different between uh, the arterioles and venules and then the capillaries. Okay, so this is an arteriole, and I hope this is also stressing how small these arterioles are, because these are whole cells, basically, and there's around five cells, at least in my drawing, there is, but there's not, you know, that's around right, basically. Okay, so there are, you know, these are whole cells, so this is a tiny, tiny structure, basically. Okay, so those are the endothelial cells. And then surrounding the endothelial cells, you'll then have a basement membrane. Now, this basement membrane is mainly made up of collagen, okay? Many different types of collagen. So, for instance, it's got collagen-3 there, collagen-7, collagen-4, okay? But it's also got other proteins, such as fibrillin and laminins in it. And uh, the endothelial cells are attached to the basement membrane. Specifically, they attach to the laminins within the basement membrane. Okay, and this is what's holding them uh, in their positions. They, the, the reason this cell hasn't just flopped down into the, you know, hasn't just dropped off is that it's attached to the basement membrane. Okay, and then surrounding uh, this, you then have a layer of smooth muscle, and that's important. Uh, even though this is a tiny little blood vessel, you've still got smooth muscle cells surrounding it. Okay, so these smooth muscle cells are arranged circularly. So, let's say here is a smooth muscle cell. Okay, and to emphasize this even more, I might draw a complete ring of one. Okay, now it's not as though you've only just got a single ring of smooth muscle cells around here. You will have slightly more than that. You'll have multiple rings. Uh, but this is actually quite important for how these are going to function, so I will draw this out. Okay, so, you have these complete rings of smooth muscle cells around the outside here. Okay, now, what's the significance of this? Well, basically, if you can imagine what's going to happen when these vascular smooth muscle cells contract, and by the way, the abbreviation for vascular smooth muscle cell is VSCMC, uh, for vascular smooth muscle cell. Okay, uh, so what's going to happen when these vascular smooth muscle cells contract? Well, all of these cells will decrease in length, basically. Okay, so um, imagine all of them now decreasing in length. What does that mean? Well, it means that the circumference of this ring of vascular smooth muscle cells is going to go down. So if I do this with my fingers, if this is a ring here, okay, now the circumference is going to go down. The importance of that is that the diameter of the ring also goes down, okay? The ring is going to constrict. Now, if this ring of smooth muscle cells constricts, then it's going to constrict the endothelium sitting on the basement membrane within. So you're going to get the whole lumen of the blood vessel constricting. So when these vascular smooth muscle cells contract, you will get vasoconstriction, which will reduce the blood flow through. Or alternatively, if they... Uh, relax, then you'll get uh, dilatation, basically. Uh, the ring of smooth muscle cells will uh, get a greater diameter, and that will increase the diameter of the lumen of the blood vessel. Okay, so that's the structure of an arteriole. Now let's turn our attention to the structure of a capillary. So capillaries are tiny little blood vessels. They only need a single endothelial cell to make up their complete endothelial circumference. Okay, so here is one single endothelial cell. Okay, and then it will be sitting on a little basement membrane. Again, here. Okay, so these are tiny little blood vessels, truly tiny. Okay, and they're around one cell thick, so one red blood cell will be able to squish its way through there, and that's about it, basically. So, these are tiny, tiny blood vessels. Okay, so this is the structure of a capillary here. And they have nothing outside of the basement membrane. You don't have any smooth muscle cells or anything like that. Now let's turn our attention to the structure of a venule. Okay, so venules are kind of like arterioles, but without the vascular smooth muscle cell layer. Okay, or you can think of them, and I would encourage you to think of them this way, as just big capillaries. Okay, so here is 
um, endothelial cells. So again, you'll need now multiple endothelial cells to make up the complete circumference of the endothelium. Okay, so here's a third one. Oh, and I'll put nuclei in these two. Okay, and then we'll put another one here. And I want to make it kind of the same size as the arterioles. So I'll have five endothelial cells making up the complete circumference. Okay, so here's our venule now. And again, these endothelial cells will be sitting on a basement membrane of collagen, and this is what's supporting them. This is what holds them in their position and stops them just from flopping down. This is the real rigid structure that is holding the venule together. Okay, so this is a venule then now. And then you have nothing outside of that. So it's a very simple structure with a very thin uh, wall, basically. It just consists of endothelial cells sitting on a basement membrane. Okay, right. So you'll have these sort of blood vessels all over the place in your tissue. Now what's going to happen is these pro-inflammatory mediators here, the interleukin-1, the tumor necrosis factor alpha, and the histamine are going to come and act on endothelial cells um, in these blood vessels, basically, and they're going to trigger the acute inflammatory response. Now, these um, two well, these three different um, pro-inflammatory mediators are going to trigger different responses in the endothelial cells. So interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha trigger pretty much the same response, and histamine triggers a different response. So let's start with what, um, well actually let's firstly tell, I'll firstly tell you the name of the response that each is going to uh, cause. So histamine will diffuse from the mast cells to the endothelial cells, and it's going to trigger what's known as type 1 activation of these endothelial cells. Okay, so histamine leads to type 1 activation of endothelial cells. And we'll actually see later that bradykinin, uh, which is the product, and also caladin, uh, which is also a product of the catacrine kinin system, they're both also going to trigger type 1 activation, but we'll see that much, much later. Okay, whereas interleukin and tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, sorry, interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, they trigger what's known as type 2 activation of the endothelial cells. Okay, so type 1 activation of endothelial cells happens quicker. It happens in a few minutes, okay, whereas type 2 activation takes hours. So we'll start with discussing type 1 activation, we'll then talk about type 2 activation. Now they trigger very similar results, almost identical results, um, but the way that they do it is different. Type 1 activation doesn't involve any changes to gene expression, whereas type 2 activation does involve changes to gene expression. Okay, so in type 1 activation, the first thing that's going to happen is that the endothelial cells will start producing uh, prostacyclin and nitric oxide. Okay, so they're going to start producing prostacyclin, which is often abbreviated to PGI2. So this is prostacyclin, also called prostaglandin I2. Okay, prostacyclin. And they're also going to start producing nitric oxide. Now, what do these two molecules do? Well, they will cause relaxation of vascular smooth muscle cells. Okay, so what's going to happen is all of these endothelial cells, the endothelial cells of the arterioles, the endothelial cells of the capillaries, and the endothelial cells of the venules, they're going to start chucking out prostacyclin and nitric oxide. Now, in the arterioles, you can see the point of this. Uh, it's very easy to understand the point of it. Uh, the prostacyclin and the nitric oxide will go back uh, to the vascular smooth muscle cells, and they will trigger uh, relaxation of those vascular smooth muscle cells. When these vascular smooth muscle cells relax, that will increase um, the circumference of this ring of vascular smooth muscle cells, and that will cause vasodilatation. So these two things are going to lead to vasodilatation. Okay, um, 
And that, when you vasodilatate these blood vessels, what's the point of that? Well, it means that uh, the lumen of the blood vessel will get bigger. So the amount of blood that you're going to allow to flow through your infected tissue is going to get greater. Okay, now why would you want a greater blood flow to the uh, infected tissue? Well, remember, all the troops that are going to help destroy the pathogen, they are within the blood. Okay, so you need to remove these troops from the blood and move them into the interstitial space. So if you've got a greater blood flow, then your delivery of troops to the site of infection is going to be greater. So that's why you want to vasodilatate uh, your blood vessels. Okay, now this leads to the infected area becoming red and these sort of conditions are always said in uh, dead Latin or Latin, uh, sorry, dead um, Italian, that's what people call it, uh, which is Latin, okay? Uh, so instead of saying redness, people for some reason always say rubor, which is Latin for uh, redness, okay? It also leads the infected area to become hot to the touch, which is calor uh, in Latin. Okay, so. Um, vasodilatation leads to rubor and calor of the affected area, and um, this it increases the blood flow to the infected area so that you can um, recruit more troops from the blood into the infected area so that they can fight the pathogen. Now, it's slightly less obvious why you'd want the capillaries and the venules to start secreting prostacyclin and nitric oxide as well. However, when you think about it, it does make sense because even though they themselves don't have vascular smooth muscle cells around them, uh, so they haven't got anything to dye the tate or to relax, um, what you have to remember is that the tissue is full of blood vessels. Okay, so we've got one arteriole with a capillary bed leading to a venule, but of course this isn't the only one that's going to be supplying the tissue. There will also be other blood vessels nearby, and you know, there could be another arteriole running just along here, so this could be an arteriole here. So let me colour it in red to denote arteriole, okay, which is about to split into its capillary bed, okay. So, basically, these capillaries and venules producing prostacyclin and nitric oxide, those might diffuse over to neighbouring arterioles and trigger vasodilatation of those arterioles. So even though you can't immediately see why uh, vasodilatating, oh, sorry, why capillaries and post-capillary venules producing prostacyclin and nitric oxide, um, what's the point of that? Well, um, because there could be other arterioles in the vicinity of those capillaries and post-capillary venules, which again will be supplying this tissue, then that's, that's the purpose of those producing these vasodilatatory uh, molecules. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.